Yeah, it's the archivist, y'all, exclusively interviewing Razel. And who is the godfather of the fifth element, Razel? Yes, that's me, right? <laughs> I guess so. And since 1979, two Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five, me and an admirer, cousins, right? Share on what got you started in order to beatbox and make many different hits. How I got started beatboxing is pretty much out of necessity. Not having turntables or an instrument. Absolutely. And you know, you kind of left with your devices, which, you know, as a kid, you know, it's your creativity. So that's pretty much how the beatbox kind of, you know, evolved in, in, in my life, you know. So. And coming up, being a roadie with the ultra magnetic MCs and mm -hmm. working with Mikey D and LA Posse. Main source, share on these experiences. I mean, back then it was, you know, it was a good time. It was, you know, you're young, you know, you're creative and you're just coming up with stuff and just being inventive. Coming up, you know, loving hip hop and wanting to be a part of the culture. You know, those are the people that I came across in my path that, you know, we had similar creativity. And, you know, to me it was a good time, you know, because it was one of those free spirited. You know, we go, we party at the clubs, we party, party at the famous Latin quarters. You know, we go around the different neighborhoods, block parties, and you know, that's how we kind of like start developing and honing in on our craft. You know, that's what we had to do. And Paul C, let us know and anything you like to elaborate on during the early 90s era. I mean, early 90s era, I mean, for, for me, it was... I mean, to me, it was just like a blueprint for what was to come, you know. Working with Paul C., one of the legendary producers that work with Eric B. and Rakim, you know, Super Lover C. Like, I mean, he has so many. A big influence of Large Professor, a big influence of Foul March and whole organized confusion. I mean, for me, it was, like I said, it was a blueprint for what was to come. And I was building a beatbox catalog, you know, just, uh, being able to do different sounds and different effects and drum kicks and loops and snares and all that, you know, just it was it was a good time for me, man. I was I was a, just a young young kid, just willing to learn and, and willing to grow, you know. Any times you like to tell us about sharing the stage with Scratch and many years with the Roots? I mean, you know, being with the Roots, that was just another evolution. Part of my evolution, you know, sharing the stage with Scratch, you know, that's my homie, you know, Ken Muhammad, you know, those, those are the cats that I came up with and shared similar interests and, you know, we kind of helped usher the beatbox to the next millennium, honestly, you know, a lot of cats, you know, if you, if you look online now, you see many derivatives of our styles, whether it's Kenny Muhammad, whether it's Scratch or whether it's myself, you know, you see all those derivatives. Back then, we was the movement. You know, we was the movement when it came to the fifth element, you know, the beatbox, we was the movement, and, you know, collectively we, we, you know, we ushered it and we pushed it forward, you know. So. And some of the best battles you've been in and what is the most difficult routine to ever master? It is the godfather of noise. I mean, battles, I've had so many battles back in the day. Like, you know, a lot of people like, yo, why you don't battle now? I mean, I mean, look, man, I've, I've battled over a hundred times. That's being modest, honestly. Because back back in the early 90s and late 90s, I mean, that's what you had to do to get credibility. There was no YouTube. It wasn't all these, you know, the, the internet world. It wasn't the cyber world. None of those things existed. So you had to go to different cities, different states. You had to travel abroad on your own dollar in order to get that credibility. Where, you know, now you can pretty much, you can beatbox in your bathroom on the toilet. And, you know, you get, 200,000 hits. Well, back then, you couldn't do that. You had to actually go somewhere and challenge somebody to a battle, you know? So it wasn't sponsored by Red Bull. It wasn't sponsored by cigarette companies. It wasn't big corporate events. This is the raw element of hip hop. This is raw, it's like it was in your gut. It was in your being to make these battles happen. Like, you had to go out your way to challenge somebody. Dougie Fresh was performing at Latin Quarters. I mean, this is your opportunity, so either you're gonna sneak in, or you know somebody that's gonna get you in, and 
you know, you may be taking a risk of getting your ass whooped, but you won't call Dougie Fresh out. That's how it went down. It was like a challenge. It wasn't like, you know, somebody had to set it up and round one and round two. This is like off the cuff. Everything was spontaneous. I mean, you could, it was one of those things like, that was the real reality. The real reality show where you see somebody that's really hungry and wanting to do, you know, wanting to be the best at what they do. So it wasn't nothing set up. It wasn't, you know, all right, you, you get five minutes, you get five minutes, you do your best drum and bass, and you do your best dubstep. It was none of that. It's like me coming to your house, knocking on your door, challenging you. It can't get no realer than that. So to me, that was the beauty of that era where, you know, you had to make up shit as you went along. I mean, you don't know what was going to happen. It might be a bad night for you. You know, you might have won the battle, but wind up getting your ass whooped. But that was a part of it, you know. But that's what made it exciting, you know. This hopefully didn't go too far where, you know, where something really bad happened. But, you know, it was, it, was, it was one of those things. I think the most memorable battle is a cat called the Human Beatbox King. He actually taught Kenny Muhammad, like the famous snare that everybody is trying to duplicate now, today on the World Wide Web <laughs> and all around the globe. Like he was the originator of that style and that technique and he taught Kenny Muhammad and I battled him in his own, his own turf, his own hometown. I'm coming all, all the way out of my way. I'm, I'm nowhere near home, it's like me traveling you know, it's like war. You go into somebody else's, it's like going to Vietnam. You don't know what they got, you know? You think you're gonna leave there alive? <laughs> well, it was one of those things. I went there, called the dude out, we battled, we was going back and forth, it was a great moment. You know, I felt I won, but he has the upper hand, he has the crowd. And then at the end of the day, they wasn't gonna let me leave there. That was, to me, the, the adrenaline of, holy shit, yo, I won and like, you didn't win, but you, you won, and holy shit, how are we gonna get out of here? It's like a movie, you know what I'm saying? It's like a movie, it's not, it's not scripted, it's just real raw life, like, yo, somebody snuck us out the back door. So they thinking we're still backstage, but we're like on our way to the train station, headed back to our town, and you know, now we find out the guys is coming out, the, it's like a movie, man. And I'm like, you can't, you can't even make that stuff up, it's the, the beauty of it. You know, well now everything is corporate, everything is how many hits you got, bottom line, you know, how much advertising. And, I mean, it's cool for what it is, it's, it's cool for business, but for the art, if I had to do it all over again, I'll do it the same way every time. Because it builds your integrity. It shows you who you really are. It's like, you're not hiding behind a screen name. This is you, like, you putting everything, your heart and soul on the line, knowing I can win or lose and still wind up losing in another hole. You know what I'm saying? So to me, that was the beauty of it, man. I mean, those are some good times. Those are the golden ages for me. I mean, now it's cool seeing how it has expanded and, you know, you gotta change with the times. But at the same time, I mean, to me, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm happy that I grew up in that era and I was able to be involved in it and was able to contribute, you know, like that. Those are monumental, monumental battles, battling Bismarck E in, in, in a mall. Like, who, who does that, right? You know, it's, it's, it's no sponsorship here. We're in the mall, like, people are shopping and all of a sudden you got like a big crowd. And two dudes is just going at it. You know, it's like, it's kind of like the MC battles now. Like, they're just going at it. That's how it was. But that's what made it so exciting because everything was raw, uncut. Like, there was no do-overs. There's no camera time. All right, cut. Now we're going to go to the next. No. You on the spot. We in the mall. We in front of strangers. Nobody paid no tickets to come see anything. You know what I mean? So it's like, come on, let's go. So to me, that's, I mean, you can't get no better than that. And one of the most difficult routines to master? For me, I think the production, I mean, early on the production, like the Bomb Squad, like Public Enemy sound was difficult. It was like the most difficult. There was so many things going on at the same time. But the beauty of it, it pushed me. Cause I'm like, I gotta get this, I gotta get this. But what people don't understand, like, I 
help make that movement of that doing many different things at one time simultaneously, like switching off and on and on, you know, like an orchestra. Like I said tonight, pay attention because there's a lot of things that's going on that you might miss and be like, oh, that was pretty simple, but nah, you missed the, the, the bass, the low end, the hi hats, and you miss all those intricate things, which listening to the production style and works of the Bomb Squad allowed me to do those things because, you know, beatboxing is really about drum technique and, you know, scratching. But taking it a little bit further, like listening to Public Enemy and listening to a Bobby Me Friend where everything became about the composition. So Definitely. That's what really in my mind, I'm like, yo, that's what I gotta get. You know, but this is not like listening to other people. This is listening to musicians and producers. You know, where now, you know, a beatbox they can go on YouTube and he can listen to you know, Beardy Man and like how to use the Loop Station. But to me, Loop Station didn't exist. You had to create this in your mind and your head and try to facilitate that sound with no, no gadget, no nothing, this pure vocal. And a two time Grammy winner, seven times nominee. <laughs> nominee, yeah, artist. yeah. And what are some of the fans' favorites and any of the best moments that you could tell about us in your entire as you evolve, let me give you a background on hip hop. Hip hop was never about imitating. What I mean by that, okay, if I play guitar and I imitate Jimi Hendrix, it's cool, you know, practice it. But if I can go out and make a living doing Jimi Hendrix songs, that doesn't work. In hip hop, it, that doesn't work. Now, if you imitate, you have to have a different type of instrument to imitate. You understand? Like, I'm not going to take someone else's entire catalog and try to make it my own. That's totally forbidden in hip-hop. Now, maybe in other genres, maybe people take a little bit from here and there and there. Like, yeah, I made it, I invented it. But let's keep it real. It came from somewhere, it started somewhere. I don't, I don't take credit for everything. I gotta give props to Fat Boys. I gotta give props to Dougie Fresh. I gotta give props to Biz Markey and all the cats. Ready Rock C, down with Fresh Prince, DJ Jazzy Jeff, Skinny Boys. I gotta give props to all those guys that came before Greg Nice. A lot of people don't know. Nice and Smooth, Greg Nice used to beatbox with Mantronics. You know what I mean? Mantronics with T La Rock. Like people don't understand all these elements. And these are the things that motivated me. I didn't try to imitate Dougie Fresh or Bismarck or Greg Nice, but I listened to the styles, like how can I come up with my own style that's gonna separate me where people gonna know Rozelle. You know, same thing, listening to a Kenny Muhammad or listening to a Scratch, you see they have their own styles and techniques. So you know the difference, you know when you hear Kenny Muhammad, you know that snare, and the triplets, you know all of that. You hear scratch, you know, sound like the original turntable. And when you hear me, you know the multiplicity. You know, you hear the singing and the beats and the undertones and the low ends. And it's totally different. And we're able to elevate that. Well, now, where kids, they just jack your shit. They jack your shit. And then claim that it's theirs or claim that they never heard about beatboxing. And they just woke up one morning and all of a sudden started beatboxing. No, no, no. I'll give credit what credit's due. Michael Winslow. Bobby McFerrin, Al Jarreau, George Benson, Take Six, Zap Mama, you know, the Volci Atroci, vocal sampling, like, great vocalists, and these people have the ability to, to imitate instruments, to imitate, to imitate life, to imitate sound, like, you know, it's like, the, the beauty of it, you know, it's like, when I listen to Michael Winslow, I'm not going to jack Michael Winslow's style. He's just going. He's just going to give me a direction where to go because he's the blueprint. Okay, now you know when you're coming up with your own sound. What what fits you? What do you like? I love cartoons. I love Transformers. I'm I'm a big uh, Star Wars, like all those sci-fi type of things. So that's what listening to Michael Winslow brought those emotions out of me. So those are the things that I love to imitate. I love doing the robot computerist.
You know, like, that shit is great. You know, Steven Spielberg, like, listening to Michael Winslow, that's what, that brought that out of me. Not taking his whole shit and then saying, oh, I did that, I made it up. No. No, no. I'm giving him props saying he inspired me to look deep into myself saying, what what do you what 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 makes you you? What do you like? What when you hear sound effects, how does it affect you? What brings that out in you? You know, so to me, in hip hop, as things in hip hop, you had to be able to do more than one thing. You had to be able to write. You had to be able to produce. You had to be able to break dance. You had to be able to do graffiti. The beatbox, like you had to be able to do everything. He wasn't one dimensional. I'm not saying anything is wrong with being one dimensional, but the era I came up from, they push you to be more than just one thing. Like you had to do it all because that's how you became popular because you was the guy, you was the triple threat dude. You know, you look at Deion Sanders, he could play baseball, he could play football. He's dope all around. He's like the greatest hands down. Like you look at this dude, you look at his legacy, and you see like he crossed the boundaries. He went over, he played football. He, I mean, he played it all in one year. He went from one season playing this and went to playing baseball and was good at both. So in turn, as you go through life, you hook up with talented people, you hook up with greatness. Being with the roots, that's also a big, a big motivation. For us. like, you know, you gotta, you gotta know how to produce, you know, you gotta know how to write, you know? So it's all, it's all an evolution. You have to evolve, you know? And, and I was fortunate enough to be a part of a lot of projects that, you know, was awarded these accolades, you know? And, you know, my contribution on, on albums or songs that went platinum or went gold or was nominated or received Grammys and stuff like that, you know? To me, it just opened the door to where the beatbox needs to be. For all the young cats that are coming up, don't just put yourself in a box where, okay, I'm going to be a beatbox champion of this country or this town or this city. Be more than that. You have to be more than that. You know, you have to push the envelope. You got to keep going further and further and further. And to me, that's why I feel like when you look at me, Scratch, and Kenny Muhammad, that's how we thought. Like, yo, we got to take this to a, a whole nother level. We got to just to show people, like, you know, if you have a skill and a talent, it could be a career for you. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with battling, because I battled plenty of people in my time and my day. But as we evolve, as my mother would say, as we grow up, <laughs> we have to grow up, you know? So as we grow up, we, we start doing grown things. And, you know, that's a part of growing. That's a part of evolving. So to me, it's like for the young guys beatboxing now, the sky is the limit, you know? But you have to think that way. Yes. You, know? you have to think that way. It's totally, you have to. Don't limit yourself. You know, it's great being a beatbox champion. It's beautiful. I've said it for over 15 years. I'm the undisputed beatbox champion of the world. But at the end of the day, I prove it every time. Because when someone says no, I go up against the grain and turn it into a yes. And many eras you've been part of the elements of beatboxing and making sounds with your mouth. When will it be considered its own hip hop element? I mean, honestly, I mean, it's in a world of its own. It's in a world of its own. Unfortunately, too many of our talents and elements of hip hop you know, it's, it's all about how much money it can make somebody that has nothing to do with the art or the culture. And now all of a sudden it's relevant because I just made somebody that don't even like the music a few million dollars, you know, millions of dollars. Now all of a sudden it's relevant. To me, it's like, it's relevant on its own. If you're just smart enough, you'll do the research and, and you'll see the history of it. And it's prevalent, but it's one of those art forms where you really don't need to be like visually, I mean, it's a visual thing, but at the same time, there's so many facets, there's so many different layers of it. So many different layers, like, you know, I do scores where people don't even understand, like watching a movie and all the background music is beatboxing, instrumentation. You're in the movie right now. You're not thinking like, is that somebody, like, is that somebody beatboxing? 
like, is, is the soundtrack like actually somebody beatboxing? So, in that thought, it's totally relevant. It all depends on how you look at it. If you're looking at it from a bottom line, like how can I make money off of it, then maybe it might not be something for you or maybe you might think, eh, well, I can't make any money off it because I can't do it or I can't manipulate it or I can't take advantage of it, so eh, whatever. I mean, that's what people do. You know, they see some big radio, now, just like me and Jazz, we talk about how all of a sudden everybody now, everybody want to do dubstep and everybody want to do house yeah. music. Everybody's like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's ridiculous. And to me, you got like hip hop DJs that were like underground hardcore hip hop. Now all of a sudden they're playing this house, boom, 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 boom. tight shirts, spike hair, boom, 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 glow sticks. Oh like, wait a minute, what happened? What happened to, where did your integrity go? Like, like, for real, like, so my point saying this is like, people, if they can't make the money, it's not relevant to them. To me, it's very relevant. To the beatboxers, the young beatboxers that's really taking it to the next level, it's relevant to them as well. To the community, it's relevant. You know, I give props to the community. It's, it's a big community, it's global. I mean, that's what I do think the internet for. It was able to, to make the world a little bit smaller in that capacity. I just wish that in that capacity, it can step up the game of a lot of people's worth ethics, you know, because it makes it real easy where they really don't really do a lot of work. They just get the camera set up, have a cool backdrop, and they just do a whole bunch of beats and stuff like that. To me, it's like, nah, get your ass on a plane, come fly to New York, don't know nobody, knock on the door, can I get on the microphone and blow you away? That's real. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's real shit. That's not no, I'm, I'm in my house, or I'm in the bathroom, check me out, I can do this, I can do Kitty Muhammad, watch me do Scratch, and I, that's not real. You know, to me, like, make it relevant, be real with it, you know. You like to share about some of your projects, make the music, great yeah. knockouts. Been working on a project, you know, Superhuman, you know, working on that. You know, we're gonna try to go digital, try to get that out for the summertime. We're gonna start doing a couple of videos, you know, uh, for Superhuman um, Transformation. We'll try to do some animation for that, you know, for that animated video. We're gonna do a video with Sadat X. So, you know, the stuff that, you know, I got in the works, you know, trying to do like a, a reality slash documentary show about the life of a beatboxer because a lot of people don't really understand that, the, like I said, there's many layers. And you know where people feel like maybe you don't have a top 40 record on the radio or a top 40 video, but guess what? I got a top nationwide commercial that actually when you sit in your house and you're like, wow, sound like, nah, it can't be, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> and your best tour and largest crowd you've ever rocked. Wow, what was that? Uh, I mean, we, we did Bigger Than Splash, right, J.S.? Yeah, well, we did Splash with Beastie Boys. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Snoop Dogg. Snoop like Dogg. I mean, we've, we've, me and I mean, Jazz. With the, who. with the Who. I mean. Largest crowd, you can tell us. I mean, it's, it's, it's a few of them. I mean, Splash yeah. Festival in Germany, Australia uh, Festival with uh, Snoop and BC Boys, um, The Who with Peep and Tom, Mike Patton. I mean, some of those European festivals. I mean, some of the. Big. What's the one we did with James Brown? Remember, we was on at the yeah, same time? A lot of big European festivals. It's crazy because, you know, we're thinking like everybody's going to run to see James Brown, yeah. but we actually had the tent full of, full of like James Brown's tent. It was yeah. huge. It was thousands of people. We love what we do, man. It's not no. It's not a game. It's not no bullshit. Brazil with Megan Park, that shit was big. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people want some bullshit. and keep it real. They want some bullshit. You know, they're about the bottom line. Anything that's hot, they're gonna jump on it. No integrity. And the best hip hop memory you've been part of or contributed to? I mean, shit, the beatbox. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know what I'm saying? The beatbox. And I'm just happy to have met a lot of people, you know, in my travels, JS1, the Roots. I mean, it's somebody, Ben Harper, you know, Bootsy Collins. These are cool people, like, you know, and they, they do what they do. They haven't changed since I've met them. And, you know, that, that's the real shit. That's what I'm about. I'm not about the bullshit. I'm not jumping on the trend. I'm, I'm gonna stick to my guns and do what I do. And you have anything to say to Canada? I love Canada, man. I 
I mean, honestly, like for real, for real, I was telling JS earlier, I was like, for real, if we could just take Canada, like Vancouver, and like move it south a little bit, <laughs> you know, keep the snow-capped mountains. It's kind of like if 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 Vancouver, Whistler, if it was like the gold the Gold Coast in Australia, because you got the best of both worlds. You got the palm trees, sandy beaches. Blue waters, then you got the snow capped mountains. I mean, you can go surf, you can go ski <laughs> in the same you day. Insurance. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> it's I remember recording, this is this is a big moment for me. I remember recording SSS Tricky in Burnaby. Man, it was dope. They gave me a, a, a book this thick to read, BOs. It took like a few days to do it, man. But the game came out, it was the first game, and it came out sick, and you know. I remember that, it's incredible. did a track with Miss Master Mike on there, a couple, well, we did a couple of tracks on that, but it was dope, I mean, just the whole, the whole Canada experience, like, that whole compound is retarded. Like, for real, like, you can live there. So I can see why they put out so many games, and the games are really well put together, because the, the facility is like, you can play tennis, you can play basketball, you can shower, they got beds, and shit is for real. Now it's downtown, a big, huge high rise. Really? Wow. When, uh, last time I heard about it was Ninth Wonder when he came here to do some music. Wow. And be alive. Nice. It was 2011 and I did an interview with him. Nice, so. nice, nice. That was a great experience for me. It was dope, it was dope, you know, it was dope. And I got family in Toronto, I got family in Montreal. We've been coming here, it's, shit, 15 years. Even though they still stop us at immigration. I don't know why. You should know us by now. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, I mean, we're, we're big fans of Canadian hip hop. Shaq Clear happened to be one of our best friends. And, you know, we toured with Shaq Clear, Socrates, Solitaire, you know, Cardinal Official. And I'm quite sure Drake know who we are, but, you know, just never have, had a chance to uh, cross paths. But, you know, we always been a fan. We was definitely ahead of the curve because when we was out touring with Canadian groups, everybody was going, what is that? So, I mean, finally all of everything comes in full circle and you can see there's a lot of talent up here and there's a lot of love for, for music in general, so. And it was an incredible performance yeah. seeing everything that I got to witness. Do you have any shouts? Man, I just want to shout out to all the real people out there. Keep your integrity intact, man. If you love hip hop, you love hip hop. Don't jump on the bandwagon because it's hot, because Rihanna's doing it, or Lady Gaga's doing it, or Madonna's doing it. You know, be yourself, man. If you love it, okay, you love it. But don't, you know, do something because you see somebody else doing it. You know, just do it because you really love doing it. You know? And that's what I do. I love what I do. I ain't doing it because I see somebody else do it. And shouts to. Brazil for letting me document history with yeah, you. Yeah, man. Canada. That's how we do it big time. You know. And thanks to Perry and Dom Yeah, my Garth's. man Perry. What's up, man? And Lunettes. And this is the Archivist. And you already know the name, y'all. Yeah.